At some point, every hiker, whether they hike for a few hours or a few months, has had the same experience. It starts out as a warm sensation on a toe or your heel or maybe on the ball of your foot. If you're like me, you try to ignore it, even though you know you shouldn't. Eventually, that warm sensation turns into something worse, actual pain. At that point, you know you've waited just a bit too long to do anything about it. You have a blister. We've all been there. Me, more times than I can count. But blisters are just annoying. You slap a bit of moleskin or some duct tape on them, and off you go. A bunion, however, is way, way worse. Bunions hurt a lot. Or so I'm told. Fortunately, they are slow to develop, and not that many hikers actually get them. But the ones who do get bunions find themselves reconsidering their life choices, or at least their choices in footwear. Welcome to the Green Tunnel, a podcast on the history of the Appalachian Trail. My name is Mills Kelly, and I'm your host. There is one place on the Appalachian Trail where every hiker experiences a bunion, Charlie's Bunyan in the Great Smoky Mountains National Park. When I first heard the name Charlie's Bunyan, I couldn't help but wonder, why on earth would anyone name a mountain after a painful bone condition in your feet? To make sense of that, we turn to a local expert. And it offers a spectacular view. It really shows you what the spine of the Great Smoky Mountain looks like going out toward Davenport Gap which is called the Salty. And Charlie's Bunyan actually probably marks the extreme western end of the Salty. My name is Ken Wise, and I'm retired from the University of Tennessee Library, where I was co-director of Great Smoky Mountains Regional Project. We did uh, research and built collections about the Great Smoky Mountains. I first met Ken in the fall of 2019, when I was doing some research on the history of the trail in the archives at the University of Tennessee. And I quickly learned that if there's anything to know about the Smokies or about the AT and the Smoky Mountains, Ken already knows it. I've hiked a number of sections of the Appalachian Trail along the North Carolina-Tennessee border, but I haven't hiked over Charlie's Bunyan. So I asked Ken to describe it for us. Charlie's Bunyan is a rocky protrusion that sits right on the Appalachian Trail, about four miles north of Newfound Gap. It was scorched by a wildfire in 1925. The fire came up from burning slash from the lumber company up the North Carolina side and burned the whole knob. And then two years later, Bunyan was visited by a thunderstorm that uh, soaked the whole bald and what little vegetation there was left after the fire would loosen from the bald rock and it washed down into the defiles on the Tennessee side, leaving it just a bald, bare rock. That 1925 fire that Ken mentioned was so intense that it rendered the soil completely sterile, which helps to explain why whatever managed to survive the fire washed away in that big storm two years later. Now, prior to the fire, Charlie's Bunyan knob was uh, covered with a a spongy mass of humus. It had spruce trees growing on it, fir trees, and the usual uh, high elevation vegetation. So that's how the bald ended up looking kind of like a bunion. But how did it get the name Charlie's Bunyan? Well, as Ken tells the story, the naming of mountains was much more of a casual thing in the 1920s than it is today. There was a, uh, a Horace Capart, who was the famed author of Our Southern Highlanders, was camping with George Mazza, who was the noted photographer from Asheville. They were going to explore the Sawtooth, where uh, Capart had never been, but uh, they had a guide named Charlie Connors. Connors and Mazza went up to the Sawtooth, and Capart was an older man and he wasn't quite fit, so he could not make the trip. 
So he stayed in camp. Mazza and Charlie Connor went and visited the Salties, and then they came to this burnt over, flooded protrusion and visited it, apparently. So they get back into camp, and Connor's told Cap, uh, we went over a little uh, knoll and my feet were hurting. And he made some reference to a bunion on his foot. So uh, Capart, who was a member of the North Carolina Nomenclature Committee, he responded by saying, good, we'll put that down on the government map. At that moment, many of the peaks in the Smokies had not been named by settlers. Native Americans, of course, had had names for those mountains for centuries. But settlers like Kephart, Connor, and others were in a bit of a frenzy in the 1920s to name as many peaks in the Smokies as possible. They knew that those mountains were going to be in the new national park, and they wanted to put their personal imprint on the names of those peaks before anyone else did. The nomenclature committees Ken refers to were made up of local experts and were charged with proposing names to the U.S. Geological Survey to appear on official government maps. The thing about the Smokies, though, is that they lap over the border between North Carolina and Tennessee, which meant that there were two nomenclature committees. Fortunately for the people involved, many of those on the North Carolina committee were close friends with members of the Tennessee committee. That small circle of friends all agreed that Charlie's Bunyan should become the name of that rocky protrusion that looks a bit like a bunion on someone's foot. Unfortunately, the Geological Survey didn't quite get the memo. The U.S. Geological Survey does not have Charlie's Bunyan there. They've got it two ridges over. Another protrusion didn't get burned over as badly, but it was in the same fire. And that's where they locate Charlie's Bunyan. So to some sense, you've got the U.S. Geological Survey Charlie's Bunyan, and you have the Park Service Charlie's Bunyan. They're about I don't know, a quarter of a mile apart. In the 1920s, it was a misprint. That misprint survived into the present, and depending on which map you're using, Charlie's Bunyan appears in two different locations. There may be other instances where the U.S. Park Service and the Geological Survey have given the same name to two different peaks near one another, but if there are, I haven't seen them. Maybe they thought Charlie had Bunyan's on both feet. The AT came to Charlie's Bunyan in 1935, courtesy of the Civilian Conservation Corps. The Great Smoky Mountains National Park had opened the year before, and CCC crews were working all over the new park to construct roads, buildings, fire towers, and, fortunately for us, sections of the Appalachian Trail. The trail hikers use today is the same one they laid down almost 90 years ago. The hike up Charlie's Bunyan is a very popular one with hikers of all kinds, and for good reason. As Ken said, the views are truly spectacular. Reaching the summit at 5,564 feet can be a little challenging, but friends who have been there swear to me that the payoff is definitely worth it. Well, it's only four miles, so it's not a long hike. There is one issue, probably the worst uh, the poorest section of Appalachian Trail and Smokies runs from Newfound Gap almost to Charlie's Bunyan. It's been overused by hikers. It's rocky. It's rough. And then as you get to Icewater Springs and start down, then you have a trail that's not only rocky and rough, but one that's got water in it draining off from Icewater Spring and then coming off of Mount Capart. It can be uh, a little intimidating if you're not used to some rocky climbs. But for most people, it should be a nice day hike. Four miles in, four miles out. If you go to Charlie's Bunyan, it's worth taking in more than just a view over the spine of the Smokies. Too often, when we see a view like that, we forget to turn around and look at the mountain behind us. But if you don't turn around, you'll miss an important part of the history of the Bunyan. Now, it's an interesting thing that uh, Charlie's Bunyan is generally the uh, little protrusion that sticks out. It's a knife-edge ridge that comes right out of Greenbrier. 
and just as it reaches the Appalachian Trail, there's a, a little bump, and that's where everybody sits. If you turn around, there's a bigger knoll behind you. It's got growth on it. Trees have come back, moss have come back, sand myrtles on it. And that is probably the knoll that Charlie went over, rather than the little protrusion that sits out in front that everybody sits on. The Park Service the Trail runs on the North Carolina side of the protrusion, the AT does. But the Park Service has put in several years ago a uh, trail going off the AT, out to the Bunyan, and then back to the AT about 150 yards. So the outlet trail takes you to a little saddle and then there's a bump there. And that's what most people think is Charlie's Bunyan. But more than likely, Mazza and Connors went over the big one behind. And that's really what he thought of as a Bunyan. And it's shaped like a Bunyan too just sticks up like a thumb. I mean, you can climb to the top of it. From the top, you get a really amazing view of the saw teeth, and then out across the park from there. So if you go, be sure to follow Ken's directions and go up on the big bump behind you. And if you do feel a warm sensation on a toe or your heel, don't be like me. Stop. Deal with it and then hike on. You won't be sorry you stopped, but you might be sorry if you don't. The Green Tunnel is a production of R2 Studios at the Roy Rosenzweig Center for History and New Media at George Mason University. Today's episode was produced by me. Jeanette Patrick and Jim Ambusky are the executive producers. We want to offer a big thank you to Ken Wise for giving us the backstory on Charlie Bunyan. I also want to thank Ken personally for all the help he gave me when I was working in his archive in 2019. Original music for the Green Tunnel is performed by Scott Miller of Swoop, Virginia, and Andrew Small and Ashley Watkins of Floyd, Virginia. To help us keep making the world's best podcast about the Appalachian Trail, please go to our website r2studios.org and click on support us from there you can make a donation of any amount to help us keep doing this work thanks so much for listening and we'll see you soon